chances are, even if you don't know much about economics, you've at least heard the term supply and demand. As we start this unit, I would like to begin by defining a few terms we'll be using. The first one is market. When I refer to a market, I'm referring to any time that buyers and sellers interact. And so while yes, it does refer to a place like Kroger's, that is definitely not the only market that exists. Markets exist on the stock market, on the phone, the internet, even the street corner. Often I will use the term market to refer to the market for a particular good or service. I might talk about the market for onions. If I do, I'm talking about all the sellers of onions and all the buyers of onions and how they're interacting. When I refer to demand and supply, it's important to remember that whenever I talk about demand, I'll be talking about the, the actions of buyers. When I talk about supply, I'll be talking about the actions of sellers. This is an important distinction because buyers and sellers have different priorities in the market. And so you need to know which one is being referred to at each time. The basic definition of demand is the quantities people are willing and able to purchase at various prices. Well, that's a definition, but I'm sure it doesn't tell you yet what demand really is. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine it was third period, and I pulled up my barbecue grill and started making some hamburgers. If I was to sell these hamburgers for $5 a hamburger, let's imagine that students would want to buy seven of them. If I sell them for $4, I could sell, they would want to buy 12. If I sold them for $3, now 15 students want to buy burgers. At $2, they want to buy 20, and so on. This is called a demand schedule. What is happening to price, to the quantity, as the price is decreasing? Now let's take these numbers and let's turn them into a graphical representation called a demand curve. Notice how these numbers become coordinates on a graph. I've labeled the x-axis with a P for price, the q-axis, the y-axis with a Q for quantity. And now the, the numbers just become coordinates for my graph. And so at $5 I drew a dot at 7 at $4, 12, at $3, 15, and at $2, 20. And then I drew a line to connect the dots. This is a demand curve. I'm going to show you a cleaned up version so we can just look at what a demand curve looks like. Notice that the demand line is an inverse slope, or in other words, it is downsloping. A demand curve will always be downsloping. And the question is, why is that? Well, what is happening to, as the price decreases, what is happening to the quantity that people are willing and able to purchase? An important part of the definition of demand is that they are willing and able. And so in that example earlier about the hamburgers, maybe there were more students who wanted to buy burgers but just didn't have the money. Or there might have been more students who had the money but just didn't want the burger. To be part, counted as part of demand, you need to be willing and able. And so notice what's happening to the quantity as the price decreases. Well, this becomes the law of demand. The law of demand says that as price goes up, quantity demanded goes down. Or you could say it the other way, as price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. If you've ever been to a Black Friday sale, you know that this is true. That as the price goes down, definitely more people want the product. And as price goes up, you've all seen prices go up and you decided not to purchase the product or to purchase less of the product because it was more expensive. Earlier I told you that demand will always slope downward. Why is that? There are three main reasons. The first one is called diminishing marginal utility. I know that phrase seems like a mouthful. Just remember that marginal means extra. And utility means satisfaction. So it basically means less additional satisfaction. I call it the law of Thanksgiving dinner. Let me show you a video 
that illustrates this idea of diminishing marginal utility. In the mouth is when you make the call. Though. There they go. It's all about meat eating. Now you see, it would appear that Joey's eating a little bit more balanced. Now probably actually has that throw power. It's almost reptilian. He can bring the dogs down. Joey's more of a chipmunker. Ooh, he mishandled one of those dogs right there. Joey is in the lead. Kobiachi is just a little behind. The five dog eat off. And there it is. That's three down. I guess it's a dog difference. He's going for the water. He's a precious few seconds. Precious seconds. And they just flip Kobayashi over to Because he four. can cannibal. They can cannibal. Kobayashi just gets it down. And Joey matches him. We're going for the last dog now. Kobayashi's pushing it in. Joey's pushing it. Joey Chestnut looks to be done. Joey, Joey Chestnut. Chestnut. Wow, Joey Chestnut. The passion is raw, but the hot dogs are cooked. That's the most amazing competitive eating contest I have ever seen. And Kobayashi is absolutely crestfallen. He brought everything he had to Coney Island today. Okay, I'm going to stop the video there. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a hot dog before. I assume you have. Probably you haven't had as many hot dogs as these men have. But if you've ever gone to a barbecue and had that very first hot dog of, of the season, the hot dog tastes great. The second hot dog never tastes quite as good as the first one. And the third and the fourth, in fact, there's eventually a point you get where one more hot dog gives you negative satisfaction. It would make you sick to eat another one. This is the law of diminishing margin utility. It says it's the amount, it says that the amount of additional satisfaction a consumer receives diminishes with each additional unit. And so, however much satisfaction you get with the first unit that you purchase is never the same amount as you get with the second, or the third, or the fourth, and so on. And so, they're not as valuable for you later on. It's the reason why they have BOGO sales, buy one, get one half off at Payless. Because they know as you go in to buy a pair of shoes, that the second pair of shoes is not as valuable to you as the first pair. And so, they give you a deep discount in order to give you the incentive to buy that second pair. That's why I call it the law of Thanksgiving dinner. Because that first bite of Thanksgiving dinner is so amazing. But by the end, one more bite will almost literally kill you. And so there's no more satisfaction left. The next reason why demand slopes downward is the income effect. That basically says that the greater the price, the less your income can buy. Well, that makes sense. You know, when prices start increasing, we can buy less of a product. And the third reason is the substitution effect. And that says that people will often substitute a lower priced item for a similar higher priced one. For example, when I go to the supermarket for my weekly groceries and I notice that chicken is on sale, I may buy less hamburger than I was planning on and buy more chicken instead if it's cheaper than the hamburger and vice versa. Many products are equivalent in our mind, or at least close to it, can be, at, can be treated as substitutes. And so when one price increases, we're going to buy less of that because we can buy a substitute instead.